Lying within the beautiful blue waters of the Aegean Sea are the group of islands known as the Cyclades. Several of the 220 islands belonging to the Cyclades are famous today for their luxurious beach resorts, fine cuisine, and vibrant nightlife that attract millions of tourists every year. But 5,000 years ago, life on these islands was very different. In a past program on Neolithic Greece, we saw how one of the Cycladic islands, that of Milos, was the source of the raw obsidian used by people on the Greek mainland for making sharp tools and arrowheads well over 10,000 years ago. Several thousand years later, around 3000 BC, trade in such raw materials increased during the Aegean's Bronze Age. Bronze is an alloy consisting primarily of copper and tin, though often small amounts of other elements, such as aluminum or arsenic, are added to give it specific properties. The proportions of these two main elements can vary, but a typical composition for bronze is approximately 90% copper and 10% tin. Many islands within the Cycladic archipelago had, and still have, significant deposits of copper, along with silver, lead, and various types of marble. This latter stone has made the Cyclades quite famous amongst archaeologists, not for the marble itself, but what the Bronze Age inhabitants of the islands created from it. Specifically, figurines and small statues of a very unique style that is appreciated by art enthusiasts even to this day. Though relatively simple, and at present lacking much color, thorough analysis by scientists has revealed that these objects were once painted with facial features and adorned with jewelry. Their true purpose, though, is unknown. They could have been idols of some fertility goddess, depictions of guardian spirits that protected the souls of the deceased, or simply a representation of the people who once occupied these islands so many thousands of years ago. Who were the prehistoric peoples who created these items, and where did they come from? As stated earlier, the island of Milos supplied the Greek mainland with obsidian at least 10 to 12,000 years ago. However, as of now, there's no real evidence of established communities living on any island of the Cyclades until the latter part of the Neolithic period, roughly between 5300 to 3300 BC. The earliest group of people believed to have been living there are from what archaeologists call the Saliagos culture. Before the Neolithic agricultural revolution, when people lived as hunter-gatherers, there would have been few resources on most Cycladic islands that could have been used to support a full-fledged community, the exceptions being fish, a few species of birds, wild fruits, and wood for constructing some sort of shelter. Most archaeologists believe that those who visited islands such as Milos to obtain obsidian or even to catch fish such as tuna likely never became permanent residents there. But with the advent of agriculture and the domestication of certain animals, it became much easier for people to not just permanently occupy such islands, but even thrive there year-round. And so, communities from the mainland boarded their small, sailless boats with seeds and farm animals to start a new life on some of the more inhabitable islands of the Cyclades. Their first boats were probably simple dugout canoes that, depending upon the weather and ocean currents, could probably travel up to 20 kilometers per day. Along with the rowers, such ships could also carry small quantities of grain, animals, pots, minerals, and of course, a few human passengers from one island to the next. Later boats from the Cycladis, which archaeologists have dubbed long boats would be larger and may have required crews of up to 25 people to man them. Today, the island of Saliagos is only about 110 by 70 meters in size, 
but up until sometime during the Middle Ages, when it was still part of the Byzantine Empire, it was linked by land to the neighboring islands of Paros and Antiparos. Those who inhabited this area in the late Neolithic period were simple fishermen and farmers who mostly grew barley, wheat, and herded sheep, goats, pigs, and some cattle. Archaeologists also found tools made of stone, bone, and obsidian from Milos. However, the most famous find is a small stone figurine, today known as the Fat Lady of Saliagos. Archaeologists and anthropologists both believe that the community on Saliagos was not too different than those found on the Greek mainland, with the exception that fish made up a greater part of their diet. This was deduced by the large quantities of fish bones discovered at the settlement. The early Bronze Age prehistory of the Cycladis is generally divided up into three periods, which, according to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, are Early Cycladic I, from roughly 3200 to 2800 BC, Early Cycladic II, from 2800 to 2300 BC, and finally, Early Cycladic III, from about 2300 to 2000 BC. These are very general divisions and correspond roughly to changes in the styles of pottery and art throughout the islands. In fact, archaeologists divide each period further into more phases, but to keep things simple, we'll be sticking to the main three that were just mentioned. The people of the early Bronze Age Cycladis didn't have any form of writing that we know about, and so Reconstructing their history is based primarily on various archaeological discoveries, most of which have come from the many prehistoric cemeteries found throughout the islands of the Aegean. It's during early Cycladic I when what we today associate with prehistoric Cycladic culture and its art really began. The earliest culture from this period is known as the Grotta Pelos culture, named after the sites of Grotta and Pelos on the islands of Naxos and Milos, respectively. The cemeteries at these sites are made up of cyst graves constructed out of marble slabs. The most prominent art from the early Cycladic I period are small, violin-shaped figurines, similar to those of some Neolithic communities from the Greek mainland. However, as time went on, the craftsmen and artists from the different islands developed their own unique and more naturalistic styles, such as those found on the islands of Paros and Naxos. By the early Cycladic II period, nearly all of the large islands of the Cyclades had settlements on them. Most of them appear to have been rather small, and not more than two to three acres in area. It's estimated that very few of them had more than 100 people at any given time, with the smaller settlements consisting of perhaps just a few families. The Cyclades was not a place of large and densely populated urban centers, such as those found in the Near East from around the same time. The exception to such small settlements may have been the one attached to the cemetery at Chalandriani on the island of Syros where over 600 graves belonging to the members of 50 to 60 families have been found. Most archaeologists have concluded that life in the Cyclades was rather peaceful and, for many, very profitable. The geographic position of the Cyclades in the middle of the Aegean world allowed its people to trade quite freely with its neighbors on the Greek mainland, the island of Crete, and communities further to the east in Anatolia. For the people of the Cyclades, relations with the neighboring islands and nearby continents of Europe and Asia were fundamentally important. Such small communities couldn't produce everything on their own, and so they traded with their neighbors for bronze tools, marble, animals, extra sources of food, obsidian blades, 
and really anything of value that was rare or non-existent where they lived. By the early Cycladic III phase, from roughly 2300 to 2000 BC, the various Cycladic cultures began to transform. This wasn't necessarily a bad thing or representative of a decline, but on the contrary, it may have been quite beneficial materially to the island's inhabitants in the long run. By the end of the early Cycladic period, the small, dispersed communities throughout the island seemed to have disappeared or coalesced into larger towns beside sheltered harbors that were adjacent to plots of fertile farmland. The new culture and lifestyle that was appearing throughout the southern Aegean was greatly influenced by another seafaring people from the large island of Crete to the south. These were the Minoans. One of the greatest innovations that contact with the Minoans would have brought to the Cycladis were their larger, faster, and more robust ships that could outcarry and outrun any canoe or longboat from the Cycladis, which, rather quickly, made the latter all but obsolete for long-distance trading. The Minoans spread out quite far from their homeland on Crete, not just throughout the Cycladis, but also to the shores of the Peloponnese, Argolis, and other coastal areas of the Greek mainland, western Anatolia, the Nile Delta in Egypt, and beyond. As Minoan commercial and cultural influence spread, perhaps the first to adopt it outside of Crete were the scattered inhabitants of the Cyclades, who themselves as seafaring people would have appreciated the Minoans' more advanced nautical technology. Soon, Minoan colonies were popping up throughout the islands and these grew into trading emporiums and towns that attracted the native communities of the Cycladis to them. Within a few generations, these people adopted Minoan culture and technology as their own. This is one explanation for what may have happened on the southern islands of the Cyclades. In the northeastern Cyclades region, there's evidence that the people there adopted some of the technology of the inhabitants of western Anatolia, though their influence doesn't seem to have been as transformative as that of the Minoans further south. But what do you think led to the eventual disappearance of the early Bronze Age Cycladic cultures? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. And as always, I'd really like to thank the channel's patrons for making videos like this possible. These include, but are certainly not limited to, Grandkek69, Yaptograph, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wenix TV, Robert Morgan, Strobex, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Michael Trudell, Leader Titan, Micah G, John Scarberry, Andrew Bomer, David R, Stephen Ball, Monty Grimes, Franz Robbins, Cyrus Mir, Daya Nastra, Nimrod Nir, Hypnos San, Brendan Redman, Faridun Darachanji, Jimmy Darawala, Anahita Debu, Gulistan Debu, Sher Kama, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I mean X, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.